Geophysical survey techniques offer unique approaches to pr research, preservation, and interpretation, particularly when subsurface testing is limited or untenable. Historic archaeological excavations are severely limited in Utah, given the lack of curation facilities, willingness, or ability to care for historic artifacts. Geophysical surveys can provide the necessary view of the archaeological record that can foster research and interpretation in the absence of excavation. Here we report on successful survey methodologies, methodologies aimed to address site impacts, interpretation of historic land use, and urban and household infrastructures along the Transcontinental Railroad. A century ago, America completed the largest infrastructure undertaking for its time, built almost entirely by the hands of immigrants from around the world, connecting the East and West Coasts with the Transcontinental Railroad. Among these immigrants, Chinese laborers provided much of the needed manual labor for railroad construction for the Central Pacific Railroad Company. The harsh conditions and difficult work required large numbers of workers. To meet this demand, Director Charles Crocker partnered with labor contractors to import thousands of laborers directly from China, and by 1867, approximately 11,000 Chinese men were laying track and constructing tunnels for the Transcontinental Railroad. Once completed, many laborers remained employed with the Central Pacific to provide maintenance and continued updates to the railroad. The railroad landscape in Utah preserves the material culture of the many hundreds and thousands of men and women who, in the hopes of a more prosperous life, made their way to the Utah desert. Sites along the grade in Box Elder County, Utah, preserve the material remains of Chinese campsites, including dugouts, refuse pits, as well as more permanent settlements of segregated Chinese occupations at town sites like Terrace. In 2016, we began field investigations using ground penetrating radar survey to assist the Bureau of Land Management and Preservation and Interpretation at sites along the eastern portion of the Central Pacific Line. Our first surveys investigated two cemeteries associated with the historic railroad town site of Terrace. Oral history and offense are all that remains of old Terrace today. Archival information is lacking and it is not known who, if anyone, is buried at the cemetery. Our first radar survey was conducted to confirm the presence of burials within the fenced area at Old Terrace Cemetery. Working with the Native Summer Mentorship Program at Utah State University, we collected one 20 by 20 meter radar grid using half meter transects. Our results are suggestive that at least one, possibly two burials are present in the fenced area. You can see in this image, particularly in the profile perspective, two buried features that are similar to historic graves found elsewhere in the region. We returned the following summer to collect radar data at Terrace Cemetery, located just east of the historic town site. Terrace Cemetery today includes standing headstones with known burials like that of Mr. Henry Gray, born in New York and passed in July of 1899 at the age of 76. Other burials are known to be present, but are either not marked or marked with no associated information. The site is, however, still actively visited by descendants. Once again, our task was to assess for interpretation and preservation purposes subsurface burials at the cemetery. Our results were more conclusive here than at Old Terrace Cemetery. You can see in the first image a row of known burials and their resulting radar signatures. In addition to the marked graves, we were able to identify several unmarked graves inside the fenced area and several more outside of the fence. There are challenges to radar surveys in the West particularly with vegetation impediments. Generally, radar produces well-defined subsurface imagery of the archeological record. Radar prospection was conducted in the area of the Chinese bunkhouse and cookhouse identified on the historic map from the Hague Collection. Two large depressions correlated with the locations of these buildings identified on the map. 
surface materials seem to support the building's past functions given that the cookhouse location contained many food jars and bottles within or just outside the depression. The bunkhouse depression contained less cultural material, but contained opium tins and gaming pieces, which reflect activities that would likely occur in this context. Upright posts and boards were located within the probable building footprints and provided the potential extent of the structures. The ground surface was quite uneven within the building depressions, but legible radar data was still able to be gathered. The two-dimensional profiles of the radar data were difficult to interpret, but the three-dimensional time slices revealed promising cultural anomalies. Specifically, this image shows a series of brighter reflections that form a linear shape. In the southeastern portion of the grid, the bright white reflections also form a corner, potentially representing a building corner that does not have an embedded post, which are represented by yellow dots. The red dashed lines represent the approximate extent of the supposed building locations based on the radar reflections and the surface evidence, including the depressions and posts. At Bovine, our radar survey was able to image a subsurface feature located in the area of the site thought to contain dugouts, possibly Chinese dugouts. Material culture on the surface suggests that this area of the site was occupied by Chinese workers and included materials like ceramics, bottles, opium tins. One of the depressions was chosen for a radar survey. Once again, we collected using half meter transects and the 400 megahertz antenna. The results demonstrate a highly reflective surface at about 20 centimeters below the surface. We think that this surface results from a compact floor, possibly a buried wood plank floor. In September, archaeologists Chris Merritt, Mike Sheehan, and Ken Cannon excavated a house feature at Terrace, revealing a portion of a wood plank floor. We hope to return to Terrace to collect radar on that unexcavated portion of the house feature so that we can compare the results from the bovine feature. Our final example of the use of radar at historic sites comes from Maitland. A wildfire broke out along the railroad in the early summer of 2020, burning a number of architectural features, including culverts and trestles. The historic site of Maitland was particularly damaged. We returned after the fire to conduct a radar and drone survey to assess damage for the Bureau of Land Management. Several radar survey blocks were collected using half-meter unidirectional transects. We identified a single subsurface feature about 55 centimeters below the surface. Through po data post-processing, we could see that the feature included a buried wooden platform. The platform likely served as the foundation for a building and may have been used to store and load various railroad cargo. The drone imagery illustrates the unique opportunity afforded by the fire to visualize the ground surface. A number of historic features are now visible that were not visible prior to the removal of the vegetation at the site. Today we have shared how radar and drone surveys can be used together to assist in the interpretation and preservation of historic archaeological features. The examples from these three different feature types discussed illustrate the utility of radar, including burials, large buried foundational structures, and small house features.